All right, well, welcome everyone. I'm uh, Greg Corolla. So I lead our business development team at AWS for our database and analytics services. Uh, and joining me today is Ryan and Elliot from Equinox Fitness. Uh, so um, in terms of the agenda, uh, for those of you that might be new to Amazon Redshift, I just have a quick like introduction up front and then I'll go through some recent updates uh, for those of you that are a little more experienced in terms of Redshift and then the majority of the times, I'll probably take like 15 minutes or so, the majority of the time will be your Equinox to talk about their case study and some of the lessons learned that they had in terms of their migration to a cloud data warehouse. Um, and I will just call out as, a, as an advertisement, if you're sticking around till five, I have a whole hour at five o'clock to get into more tech details on Redshift, so if you're interested, um, to, you can see me at five o'clock as well. So I think like when we think about analytics, and kind of where it sits in terms of the overall AWS portfolio. I'm um, sure there'll be lots of you know, sessions later and throughout the day or you know, follow-ups we can do, but the point is to kind of think about, we have this broad breadth of services in terms of ingesting data, storing it, and analyzing it. Um, and so whether you have streaming data or clickstream data or you know, ingesting from Internet of Things devices or just transactional systems, you know, this, this idea that you know, moving away from a single monolithic architecture where you just had, you know, a data warehouse and that was it, or maybe a Hadoop cluster, to, you know, decoupling compute and storage, thinking about what's the right web service to match the use case, and then having a, a rich set of collection of components to pull from provides a lot of choice that can helpfully match in terms of cost and performance and, and really innovation, right? And today, you know, we're going to talk a little bit in depth on Amazon Redshift, but if there's questions, you know, on other... AWS services, I'm happy to take them, you know, off in the hallway afterwards as well. But I think, like, if you're new to Redshift, I'm just curious, like, how many folks in the audience use Redshift today? A show of hands. So maybe hopefully half or so. Um, so th th those of you that might be new, so Amazon Redshift was the first cloud-native data warehouse we launched back in 2012. Um, and really, we took the idea that, you know, for, you know, analytics, it turns out that SQL is still a pretty popular language, right? and visualizing it through BI tools. And so we want to be able to deliver, uh, you know, really fast performance, give you that ability to, you know, not have to pay the upfront costs you know, in a new pricing area. So if you're familiar with the uh, uh, data warehouse space, I mean, it's not unusual to have tens of thousands, if not 40,000s of dollars per terabyte per year. And so with Redshift, you know, it can be as low as $1,000 per terabyte per year. And so I, I would argue if you kind of look at some of the the, the analysts and press and things like that, that really this, this, you know, Amazon Redshift was the first to really bring the performance and scalability of an MPP or massively parallel processing data warehouse at a price point which really made it advantageous for, you know, anyone to adopt, right? And the fact that you can start small so you don't have to pre-provision ahead of time, you can simply say I need, you know, a couple hundred gigabytes of data, but then, you know, go all the way up to petabytes of data, right? And so we have customers that you know, we'll maybe start a new project with Redshift for analytics, right? And then figure out, well, I've got additional data, additional data. And, and generally we think that, you know, our average customer, you know, roughly doubles their Redshift usage per year because they keep collecting more data and finding new use cases. And, and this is sort of like net new projects, but over time we saw that customers started saying, well, I've got these, you know, data warehouse appliances from all the kind of vendors I'm sure we could, could name um, and, you know, there was nothing unusual about the workload that couldn't fit into Redshift, and so thinking about the cost and flexibility, and so moving this, this trend from, you know, new use cases to actually doing migrations has become, I think, the, the latest trend that we've seen over the last, last few years. And then, you know, I, I think in terms of security, I think it's really an important piece because, you know, in the analytics space, I mean, thinking about your customer data, your, you know, which can be PCI data, could be HIPAA compliant data that, you know, that it needs to be secured and encrypted and access control. And so I think this, this security piece, I think, is oftentimes, you know, a key reason that uh, customers look to Redshift to be one of their first workloads in AWS because they can store all of their data. And whether it's, you know, healthcare life sciences, financial services, U.S. government agencies, uh, government agencies across the globe have really been embracing Redshift. And I think, you know, uh, the access control, security, and the compliance certifications that Redshift can deliver has oftentimes been a, a deciding factor when, when looking at a, a cloud data warehouse. And the other part in terms of some of my introduction, you know, so 
you know, thinking about the history of data warehouses, you know, typically you'd have some kind of local disk and then you wanted to load the data into the warehouse and have to go through this extract, transform, and load process. And, you know, on the other side, there was a, a trend towards, you might call it a data lake, right? Where, you know, primarily started off with HDFS in terms of on-premise um, Hadoop clusters and offered like low cost scalability and be able to do more schema on read where I don't have to transform and load the data into a database, but I can just read the file as it is on, on HDFS, for instance, right? And in the past number of years, we've seen an evolution where, you know, to be honest, you know, at least the customers I talk to, you know, don't really use HDFS anymore, right? You would just look at S3 as that store for data, right? Whether it's clickstream data, log data. And this idea of building your data lake on S3 has become a really popular uh, for customers like FINRA, for instance, and financial services to essentially load up to 80 billion transactions per day into S3 directly, right, for their market surveillance analytics. And so if I think about this merging of a data warehouse where I have, you know, predefined schemas, I have, you know, transforming and loading data into the data warehouse, but yet this idea of having a data lake on S3, you know, what the trend we see is merging of these two, two points, right? And so now with Redshift and a feature we call Spectrum, uh, you can actually query data on S3 directly without having to load it into your data warehouse. And so we create an external table in Redshift where the data is not local to Redshift, but the data sits on S3. And the data is not in a proprietary format like a Redshift block format. It sits in CSV or JSON or CSV, or sorry, or Avro, um, Parquet, uh, ORC, some of the columnar formats, so that not only can my, you know, BI team query it through standard SQL, but my data science team can use Spark or the Hadoop stack or another process to access the same data. And so having the ability to have, you know, the spectrum layer that seamlessly scales without having to pre-allocate the compute size becomes really interesting as we think about this combination of the data lake and data warehousing and not having to compromise in between, but being able to use the best of, best of both. And really, I think that uh, it's been this kind of approach in both the uh, performance and the cost and ease of use has been, you know, been seen a lot of tremendous adoption of, of Redshift over the years. Um, here's just a, you know, a standard, you know, some of the names that, that currently are customers of Redshift. Um, you know, I think in terms of my perspective, I've been with AWS almost five years, and I think early on, you know, many of my customers that started on, on Redshift kind of came from born in the cloud or startups. Um, because they really, you know, needed this powerful analytics capability, but didn't necessarily have the, the staff to, to roll out a data warehouse, right? Um, and so Redshift became really appealing. But now I think, you know, many times my conversations around enterprise customers, we might call them, you know, Fortune 500, you know, lights of NG Docomo in Japan in terms of telecommunications that, you know, need the cost savings and flexibility of a data warehouse, but choose to use uh, Redshift to be able to deliver that in the cloud. And you know, depending upon how much weight you give to kind of analyst reports, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, there's lots of different analysts say lots of different things, but, you know, whether it's Forrester or Gartner, um, you know, we don't necessarily break out, you know, Redshift earnings and customer base uh, separately, but, you know, some of the analysts like Forrester do some estimation by talking to their customers, and, you know, some of the data points from Forrester's report is, you know, Redshift actually has the largest cloud adoption for data warehouse, right? Um, and across the globe. And, you know, the number that Forrester says is around 5,000 production customers uh, using Redshift across the world, right? And then not only that, but some of the biggest, by far the biggest cloud data warehouses run Redshift. So I used this example of Docomo earlier. So NC Docomo has almost 16 petabytes of call detail records into a single Redshift cluster in Japan, right? And some, you know, rankings in terms of how we, we kind of look at Redshift features and functionality compared to other players in the market. And, you know, interestingly enough, one of the great benefits of Redshift as well is just the number of partners that we, that we enable as well. So, you know, oftentimes, you know, thinking about the cost savings and flexibility and having a cloud native data warehouse, um, you know, you just go through some selection. If Redshift makes sense, you know, you don't have to change necessarily the end user interaction. So if you're using Tableau or MicroStrategy or your BI tool, I mean, Redshift supports you know, all of those, you know, obviously it has open standards to ODBC and JDBC, but knowing that your existing BI reports, you know, you might have to change the connection from Oracle or whatever to Redshift, but they should work, right? Same on the data integration side. Now, it's not always as easy as just changing a connection driver, but 
tools like Informatica have native support for Redshift. And so if your ETL logic is written and you want to lever leverage a lot of that, you know, it could be as simple as you know, changing the endpoint to Redshift, but you know, there's always some details to work through in terms of you know, being able to get that uh, optimized as well. And then in terms of you know, help, in terms of system integrators, Redshift has a large and vibrant consulting partner ecosystem that can help you because you know, in terms of migrations, you know, oftentimes the, the easy part is saying, hey, move my data into Redshift. The hard part becomes you know, managing the business process and the change and you know, moving from one database to the other does require, in some cases, some help um, to be able to do that. And that's kind of the role that our system integrator partners can help play. So that's kind of the, my quick recap of Redshift. I just wanted to go through a few new features, if you're not aware, the things that are currently launched in Redshift. We sometimes, given the pace of change in AWS, some of the new features might get lost. And again, I'll go pretty quickly through this, and I have a whole session later this afternoon to go into a little bit more detail. Um, but the first one, I would just say, for those that make sense to have the high-performance NVMe SSDs, we launched the Dense Compute 2 line uh, last November um, at the same price as the previous generation. So this is, you know, as you can imagine, it's the latest Intel processors using super fast NVMe SSDs. And, you know, the new announcement here, I think I would just call out that uh, two weeks ago we launched in the console that if you're on our older generation DC1s, um, just, you know, you'll be able to, you know, continue your reserved instance for DC1s but move to DC2s, right, without having to open up support ticket or talking to anyone. You can just, you know, whatever upfront payment you made or whatever reserved instance plan you're on, you'll be able to just move seamlessly to DC2s. And definitely I recommend, although DC1s are still in the console, like, like start with DC2s. Like DC1s, as you can imagine, are older generation and you know, new workloads today. And if you have an existing cluster on DC1, we'd love to talk to you about how you can move to the DC2. And then in terms of you know, our direction for Redshift, um, I would just say that you know, we are fully committed, we meaning AWS, fully committed to making Amazon Redshift clearly the best cloud data warehouse in the market. And we have a number of enhancements I'll, on, I'll talk on here, but a number of you know, things that are coming in the coming months. And essentially our efforts are around performance, ease of use, and integration with the data lake, right? And so here's a few quotes from customers about you know, their experience in terms of performance, whether it's Liberty Mutual or Docomo in terms of the performance gains that they've seen from their legacy systems. Um, but in terms of new features, one thing I would call out is that you know, Redshift has this uh, workload management, right? where I can set up queues and say, okay, I've got a set of dashboard users, BI users, and ETL processes, for instance, and you want to have different resources at different times. Um, but we launched something called short query acceleration, where, you know, if I have these kind of, you know, BI users that expect, you know, dashboards or reports to turn in two or three seconds as opposed to minutes for maybe analytical queries, um, I can just bypass my, my workload management settings and, and make the the optimizer determine, hey, this is a shorter query, and just automatically run that faster, right? And so, you know, this idea of, of being able to deliver more queries per second or more queries per hour, and not having to, you know, go into Redshift itself, but be able to have machine learning determine this has become really beneficial uh, for many customers that can get this kind of BI or analytic, you know, the BI users that expect sub-second response time, you know, to automatically be able to take advantage of, of short query acceleration. So today you have to enable it in the console itself, and then in the coming weeks we're actually going to automatically enable this for your cluster, where you can just take advantage of this machine learning algorithm to help you know, define the workload management settings. Um, and then the next one I just talk about is result set caching. So again, kind of on this BI user or maybe someone using a Tableau dashboard, um, if you can, you know, it's no secret that if I can pull a result set from cache, right, an in-memory cache, I don't have to you know, go back to disk or to S3 to read it. And so being able to have that result set cache, in some cases has had you know, really tremendous impact on, on customers' dashboard performance for those. You know, you know, the, the query has to be eligible for caching. We can go through some details of how that's determined, but you know, having the results set in the cache and having Redshift just maintain that for you, you know, can have, you know, in some cases, you know, 5x performance increase, 10x, right? Queries can go from 10 seconds to less than a second. Uh, so giving that, you know, that boost that in-memory cache can provide, and it's just part of Redshift that you know, again, is, is included in, in some of our latest updates. Um, and then in terms of commit time improvements, and so, you know, the, the funny thing about a database is you also want to update it while you're reading it, right? And so, um, now if you notice, we don't really have the Y axis uh, defined, but, you know, just kind of speaking to kind of our improvements, you know, from, you know, we like to look at our customer data and feedback and, you know, moving to this like real-time data warehouse or having more continuous updates. And, 
you know, here's just some benchmarks that we looked at across fleet-wide. I mean, of course, you know, your workload might depend upon how you're using Redshift, but um, we continue to make improvements in terms of making commits faster, right? So typically in a columnar database, we want to like batch commits, right? Um, but, you know, we also want to give you that, that ease of use just to be able to use your continuous ETL processes into Redshift. And, um, but we don't really have, this kind of goes out to March, if, but if I look at the fleet metrics and we debated adding in like some August, but we're gonna hold off till reInvent to kind of continue this. And, you know, roughly you'll see about another 50% improvement in the coming weeks by some updates that we're putting in. I would just caveat, you know, your performance may be different, but we're looking at fleet-wide metrics, but happy to go into, into details of your cluster as well. Um, and then on query performance improvements, um, and particularly in terms of hash joins, turns out to be a majority of joins across data sets in Redshift when we look across the fleet. Um, you know, previously in Redshift, we were out, we determined, you know, from our analysis that we were over allocating memory for hash joins. And so we've done some engineering work to make sure that we just allocate the minimum amount required uh, to be able to essentially make the joins faster, right? And whether in your workloads or looking at some of the industry benchmarks like TPCH or DS, um, you know, we've seen significant improvement in terms of, of those uh, in industry benchmarks when it returns to joining data sets together. And again, this is an area that we continue to focus on. Um, and then uh, being able to have, you know, this workload management set up, but that if I'm gonna do a large write into that cluster, you know, I don't wanna be bottlenecked into the workload management until I can actually skip the queues automatically. So if it's gonna be, you know, a large update's gonna happen, I don't want it to impact my production reporting. And so we can automatically put that in a lower priority queue um, in terms of some of the enhancements in terms of workload management as well. Um, and then on ease of use, um, here's just a few quotes from customers on their, their feedback on, on using Redshift. Um, but I'll say like one of the newest uh, launches that happened uh, recently, which is just in the past couple of weeks, is something now in the console called Redshift Advisor. Um, and essentially, you know, all the data was always there. Uh, so if you know, we have this GitHub location where we have like admin scripts that you can do some, you know, investigation of your cluster, if something's slow, we get you know, lots of metrics that are being captured, and what customers told us was, hey, like, it's great I can run this script, but it would be even greater if you could just show me in the console, right, and then take action upon it. And so the first iteration of this is live, like, in your console now, now so not in every region, so there are some specifics in the release in terms of which regions are supported. Um, but essentially it gives you that, that, either from cost or performance, an easy way to see, hey, am I using Redshift to its fullest, or are there things that I could you know, maybe easily change that could have big difference in terms of, of getting faster queries or getting lower cost. And so having that just in the console itself, I think has been, been uh, you know, pretty uh, popular with customers. And then not only that in terms of some of the administration settings, but then also just how, how, how's my cluster doing? Am I underutilizing it, overutilizing it? Um, so before you'd have to look at things like CPU and memory utilization, but essentially now we have, you know, query throughput and query duration, right? as metrics you can just look at in the console. You know, throughput, you know, it just depends, you know, upon your, your view, it's, you know, because Redshift is a columnar database, we typically talk about, you know, throughput, you know, queries per hour, queries per minute. And so if I look at these two in terms of, you know, if queries are running, are they aggregate running slower, faster, <coughs> excuse me, um, but then how many queries per, per minute am I getting, kind of gives you that, that nice, nice check to say, you know, regardless of CPU and memory, like how, how quickly am I getting queries through? And so being able to visualize that directly in the console. Um, and then, you know, the last part is, you know, integration with Data Lake is kind of our third pillar. And again, you know, our belief is that over time, you know, the data warehouse and the Data Lake will, will start to merge. And we have early efforts through Spectrum uh, feature to read Parquet and ORC files directly. And here is some call outs from a couple of customers that are leveraging, you know, this feature today to read S3 uh, directly. Um, but some recent Spectrum enhancements and so, you know, support for more data types. So we added scalar JSON and ION formats. Um, we now have, you know, a very popular request, as you can imagine, support for native date format <laughs> or date type in Spectrum. Uh, so, you know, you think about like, like does a CSV file have a date? Well, no, it's a CSV file, right? But being able to still have a date based upon the data type. Um, and then depending upon how your S3 buckets are set up, you can have cross account um, roles for IAM to be able to access data in other S3 buckets, right? Um, and the last one, you know, well, the, the, the last bullet point I'll just call out, which is the copy from Parquet and ORC. So, you know, Redshift has this copy command, um, where if I did want to have the data locally in Redshift, I'd have to use copy command to invoke it to load it into local disk. Um, well, now, you know, copy command can support Parquet and ORC files. Um, the alternative to that, as I said, though, is that, you know, you can just have the Parquet and ORC on S3, 
and read it directly without having to load it, but there could be you know, times where I might want to load it, and so you know, having that copy command support Parquet and ORC has been a popular so, you know, request that's now available. And then the second to last point I'll just kind of spend two slides on is nested data support. Um, so now, you know, if you think about you know, using a dot notation, and particularly if it's nested JSON or nested Parquet files, uh, you know, how can I express this, this richness of the nested data format without having to flatten it out into a table structure? Uh, so by leveraging Spectrum, you know, you can essentially, you know, query through, you know, using the, the dot notation to easily query this nested data format. And um, if this feature is, it's been in preview for a number of months, which is our word of saying beta, um, we're actually rolling it out to the fleet this week and next, and we'll have an announcement, you know, public announcement here in the coming days to kind of officially launch this. But this should already be enabled in your cluster today, if not uh, here shortly. And, you know, querying this nested data format, you know, using SQL++ and the dot notation uh, obviously has been a, a frequent request, particularly as you look at, you know, non-traditional uh, data sources like log data that might come nested itself. And obviously there's a big, you know, uh, uh, um, implication for performance, right? So if I don't have to flatten the data out, and particularly if it's JSON, uh, flatten it out meaning, you know, map it directly to relational tables, um, not only is it easier from an ingestion perspective, because I don't have to ETL the data into Redshift, I can just query it directly from the spectrum layer on S3, but then there's also performance differences, right? Because I don't have to, because I don't have to put it into relational tables, I don't have to worry, in some cases, joining the data together, and I can just query it natively. And so um, there's lots, of, lots more to come in terms of performance increases and, and enhancements to Spectrum, but knowing that I can simply create an external table in Redshift, point it to a nested JSON file, and query it using you know, a dot notation has become you know, a pretty popular uh, request for customers, and it's a feature that's now available uh, to be able to further this integration of the data lake and, and uh, in data warehousing worlds that we see. So I know it's kind of whirlwind. I mean, I will do a, 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 an update. I just want to provide some, some key updates on, on key new features. But maybe the more interesting part is to hear, you know, beyond just hearing about you know, Redshift and how great it is, to actually hear from a customer on how they looked at this change and, and some of the benefits and lessons learned that they had. So I guess Ryan and, and Elliot, uh, you're here to talk about your, your experience. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. All right. So I'm Elliot, this is my associate Ryan, and Hello. we're going to take you through our journey to Redshift and uh, Data Lake strategy. Oh. The right oh. button. Sure. There. Ah, there we go. <laughs> All right. So how many Equinox members do we have in the room? Oh, good. Yes. Nice. <laughs> you guys get it. <laughs> so. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Equinox, we are a uh, fitness and lifestyle brand that are devoted to movement, nutrition, and regeneration. So uh, we're best known for our flagship brand, Equinox. Uh, we have about 98 locations as of now um, uh, with several beautiful locations in Chicago. We also own uh, Blink Fitness, which is a low-cost gym offering. Pure Yoga Soul Cycle, which is a boutique uh, studio cycling experience. Furthermore, which is a media arm, as well as Equinox Hotels, and we'll be opening our first uh, flagship hotel in Hudson Yards, New York City, in the spring of next year. So altogether, we have over 200 locations in our portfolio in every major city, um, in uh, London as well as Canada. So uh, yeah, just to give you an idea of our scale. So I have a question for you, Elliot. How complicated could this be? We have our gyms, we walk into the gym, lift some weights, put them down, do it like this puppy does, and that's it, right? We have some members. How complicated could it be? Yeah, so uh, if you really try hard, you can make anything complicated, and you know, Equinox has done a really good job at us. So obviously we have the complexity of our scale, you know, with over uh, 98 Equinoxes and in total 200 plus brick and mortar locations plus digital. Um, every one of our gyms has multiple lines of business, which are all run, you know, very, very efficiently from personal training to Pilates to group fitness. We also quietly operate the nation's largest corporate spa chain because we have a spa in every one of our locations. And uh, being a large business, we have all the central um, supporting functions from digital product to CRM to marketing to finance. And the other thing about it too is that it's all connected. So we have a consumer products team that are building end user applications constantly. And a number of these are also connected to Apple Health as well. So data points are flowing every which way. 
Uh, additionally, our equipment is tracking as well. So Pursuit is gamified cycling experience. And so this basically makes it uh, something a little bit more fun than you sitting in a room and cycling away. So you're actually able to see your results in real time as you are cycling. And so our bikes actually collect multiple data points per second per bike per club. So we end up with hundreds of millions of data points uh, per day. We also track what's happening on our cardio machines and on our digital scale. And we're actually working now to look into location tracking to see what parts of the gym are used uh, in the frequency. Yeah, so a little bit about our, our data journey, which is probably the interesting part. So uh, the history of data at Equinox, you know, so we built our first official uh, data warehouse type application back in 2007, 2008. It was called Life. A pun on it's not fitness, it's life, our, our brand motto. Um, so uh, most, like most traditional data warehouse implementations, it's cylindrical, as shown in the picture. Uh, it was very traditional, you know, like back in the 2000s and prior, like you'd pick some commercial off-the-shelf tools, decide if you're going to run an Oracle or SQL server, and you picked a religion. We picked Kimball, you know, and we were rigorously Kimball. You know, I'm a good friend of uh, Joe Caserta, who's a... Uh, big Kimball guy, so uh, yeah, we, we stuck to Kimball. We have a beautiful, like, dimensional data warehouse. Um, and uh, if you want to read more about Kimball, it's right there. There's still some good stuff to be learned from that methodology. Um, so life was good. You know, we had reliable reporting. We had analytics, customer profile that empowered, like, our digital products in CRM and email marketing. Um, so it was a good system. It lived a decade and served us very well. But... That's me right there. Um, the direct, uh, we had a, a couple challenges, um, you know, aside from being a 10 year old systems because things get gangly as they approach that age. You know, we had a lot of direct integrations with our applications, you know, our rapidly growing business, the data warehouse was like system of record of a lot of things related to our customers, first place where data really gets hydrated, um, a place where data gets uh, kind of integrated. So a lot of our applications started using our data, binding directly to our poor data warehouse and causing all sorts of problems for us. Um, we, something I'm gonna talk a lot about is a SDLC, so doing anything like a modern, you know, kind of test and deployment pipeline on like a traditional data warehouse implementation is not trivial. Like where am I gonna get another big set of infrastructure and you know, kind of bootstrap all of like this commercial software which really isn't friendly for doing it. So those two things coupled, like the tight coupling as well as our SDLC challenges made us accrue functional debt because we couldn't change quickly enough. We had no place to put new data. Our SQL server was already several like terabytes and there's lots of terabytes waiting outside to come in and there was no uh, good way to accomplish that. Uh, our data science and our analysts were, fl were frustrated because of our methodology as well as our constraints on development and introducing new data and we had lots of expensive commercial software. To, to solve this, we bought more expensive commercial stuff. <laughs> so we bought a uh, Teradata cluster uh, now about four years ago. Um, so we ended up getting uh, several apps up in beta. We were able to address some of our like large data sets, semi-structured um, workloads a little bit. We found that the platform required a lot of platform specific knowledge, like everybody had to go to like Teradata, like DBA school and developer school to figure out how to develop on it. Um, limited integration, unless you paid Teradata even more money. So their goal is to really get everything in Teradata so that like you spend more money and buy bigger clusters. And it was ultimately very expensive. Like I think Greg, you know, mentioned, uh, you know, 10X or, you know, kind of cost savings. You know, we will get into that a little bit more, but we actually found the maintenance and support just like for, to Teradata that we were paying we were able to cut that in a fifth, not just the original purchase, by moving to Redshift. So at this time, we were like kind of like in a quagmire of like, do we move forward with Teradata? You know, I'd you know kind of grown up like building apps in the cloud and using Redshift, and I just uh, you know said we should probably just evaluate our goals, stop and see what we're trying to accomplish. It's always a good idea when you're you know evaluating making a change or you know kind of on a uh, doing a project, so we're trying to bi build business value, we're trying to get things done quicker for our customers. Um, we are trying to reduce cost, and we are going all in in the public cloud. Uh, we want to build technology that differentiates. 
So spend less time on like administration and stuff like that and spend time building good software. And we want to embrace like modern engineering principles so we can build immortal systems, you know, which we're not really worried if a server or something goes down. So I'm going to play the devil on your shoulder. Why don't we just do what the new school says? We don't really need a data warehouse. We can just throw it all in a data lake and then just use late bind strategy. It should work perfectly, right? That, that's uh, sort of right. <laughs> so the, um, you know, th that approach works for a lot of things, but not for everything. So, you know, like, in, you know, data work warehouse versus a data lake, as Greg said, it's getting a little blurred. There's new advancements in storage technologies and tools like Spectrum and stuff. But really the way we differentiate it is our data warehouses for reliable high SLA reporting, developer and analyst friendly, um, you know, kind of workloads and analytics, as well as efficiency for specific types of data pipelines, pipelines which tend to be more mutable, where you're going to have updates, business data that changes. Um, these things are a little bit more complicated to accomplish in a pure data lake strategy. So data lakes, on the other hand, are very good at large immutable data sets. Think about logs, think about POS systems that once you make a transaction, it goes on the books and never gets touched again, um, as well as semi-structured and unstructured data. So to test this out, we had like a small internal like project, POC, um, just in our spare time, we called it Project Cosmo, and Cosmo is a little weird robot who lives in the clouds. You know, it's a picture of him there. Uh, we decided to replatform our one Teradata app related to lead analytics to Redshift and Amazon S3. Um, this is one that was a little challenging to us because, again, we wanted to tap into some of those new data sources such as Clickstream Analytics, right? So um, we were able to do this in two weeks. Um, we found it very productive. We were very happy with it, and it worked. So our beloved Teradata cluster um, was, uh, went bye-bye. Uh, it turns out there's not much of a secondary market for a lightly used Teradata cluster, so it unfortunately went to uh, technology salvage, or maybe it was made into a robot. Yeah. <laughs> so that's when we decided to make the Jarvis data warehouse. Um, from the proof of concept, we found that it worked so well, so we decided to go all in on it. And so this includes our data warehouse, our data lake, and our data services. And with our data warehouse, the architecture that we uh, built for it is that we're essentially going to have a number of apps and different services that are bringing data in. We have our own homegrown Maximilian framework that Elliot will get into, uh, but we also use Informatica to basically transfer that data into Jarvis Redshift which there uh, we are also doing some light ELT and making that data you know, ready for fact and dimension tables. We also do some lighter transformations through Informatica and Maximilian as well. But for the big transformations, that what we, that's what we save EMR for. So at Equinox, we really love Apache Spark. PySpark is absolutely fantastic. So once we get into Jarvis, we know that we do have a presentation layer that we have to service down the road, and those involve apps that we are building on our data analytics team, apps that our consumer product team is building, and also third-party apps that may be fueled by that data as well. And so what we did in the middle layer is build these data marts and APIs to help service that and maybe lighten some of the compute load on Redshift itself. For those semi-structured and unstructured, maybe those more immutable data sets, we actually send a lot of those straight to S3 itself. And with the introduction of Redshift Spectrum, we're able to use AWS Glue to define the data which essentially sits there as a virtual in-memory description of that data, and then allows you to, once you're in Redshift, query that data straight from S3, which has worked very, very well for us. And so underlying all of this, we have our data quality and monitoring services that LA will touch on. Sure, so I won't spend too much on this slide, you know, but you know, I think we know what Redshift is, and uh, you know, just from our perspective, the things that we find very helpful are the fact that it's mostly Postgres compatible, it's fast and uh, performant, ease of maintenance, although it is still an instance-based product, we perform very little in terms of maintenance operations on our clusters, and um, you know, we're just finding low barriers for our developers and analysts. So a lot of people ask, like, uh, you know, what do our data models look like? Again, we came from a very religious, you know, uh, um, Kimball methodology camp. So, you know, they're somewhat like pragmatic star schemas, that's the way we call it. You know, since Redshift is a distributed system, it's not a relational database. You don't have to do a lot of those techniques because they are really uh, optimized for relational databases. 
and uh, you know, so basically we have flattened like event tables. Um, we don't do all the weird, you know, stuff like junk dimensions, bridge tables, attribute dimensions. And Amazon Redshift is columnar, so wide tables are totally okay. And uh, of course, distributed joins can be more expensive, so reducing joins, unless it's like a data management issue, um, you know, is a good idea. And we do have dimensions. We're pretty rational and conservative. We save them for like really business data that has its own kind of life cycle, like people and employees and facilities and assets. Um, and we are very conservative with our use of uh, type two dimensions. So really from a paradigm perspective and why we find so much productivity is our developers build a data pipeline that gets a good answer and then we just put it in a table. We build some governance around that and figure out how to run it daily or intraday and we're done. So like we're able to um, bring new data assets to life much quicker than we did before. So in terms of processing on Amazon Redshift, uh, something Ryan touched on, we do light transformations within Redshift. Uh, we have a proprietary system that will soon open source called Maximilian, it's a Python uh, module, where we essentially uh, run and dynamically build like SQL scripts to um, execute our ELT scripts. All of the big crunches and semi-structured data processes happen outside of Redshift with some small exceptions. And um, really we do that to reserve query capacity. Like our Redshift is really for the analysts and the data scientists, so anything we can do to get more of them in and give them better performance, the better. So we really like proactively try to reduce kind of like ETL bloat um, and uh, you know, kind of capacity being taken from our Redshift system. And just to touch on our data lake, um, one of the reasons that we really got into it are, well, there's a number of them. So uh, really wanted to utilize the high performance, low cost blob storage that uh, S3 has. And we also wanted to make a functioning analytics store there. One of our beliefs here at Equinox is that we really want to be S3 first with a lot of the data that's coming in. If it ends up in Redshift, that's fine. But let's just make sure that we get it there in S3. Um, so we want to make sure that this was also functional. So we just didn't want to make it a dumping ground to send all the data there. As Elliot likes to say, we want to have a nice data lake, not a data swamp. Very cliche, but yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, and we also want to employ uh, flexible late bind strategies where applicable. Not all the data was going to be, you know, defined in AWS Glue and then have Redshift Spectrum or Athena, uh, you know, run queries on it from there. But where applicable, we could use it there. And then for the times that we do, we can employ the quick setup for those external tables. You know, we've had times where we've started collecting data. And that day, within minutes, we're actually able to query the data because building the external table to find that data is extremely fast. And so lastly, the other thing that we have here is uh, it's very, easily to, um, very easy to implement to dis disaster recover strategies uh, for S3. It's just a configuration change that you have to make on the bucket itself. So once the data is in there, change the configuration, and you're good to go. And so what we store here is the very first thing we actually put in here was our clickstream data. So this is very immutable data. It's essentially a log of all the data that's coming from our web applications, uh, iOS app or Android app. We also have internal apps that are sending data to it as well. And we originally projected it into Redshift and found out that <laughs> once the analysts found out about it, they actually really loved it. And because they loved it, they wanted more of it. And so originally we only had maybe 40 columns worth of data in there and they wanted more and more. And we've, what we found is that we had to keep going back to the drawing board, changing the ETL script, adding those columns in there. And then along the way, our clickstream provider was also deprecating columns that were in there too. So the data that they sent us were 550, 600 columns wide, and then they were getting rid of column 350 right in the middle of the data set. And so it was very hard to pivot whenever we needed to add stuff or make a change based on the data that was being sent. And so what we started doing there is taking all the data that was being fed from our clickstream provider and saving the entire data set in Parquet in our data lake. And then from there, we were able to define an AWS glue table on top of it and pick whichever columns we wanted. So if we wanted columns one, two, three, 499 and 525, we could just pick those specific columns, not have to define everything along the way. And so now when someone wants a new column, because all the data is being collected and put in Parquet anyways, they'll ask for it, We'll go and make a change in AWS Glue, takes 20 seconds, save it, and it's automatically available there to be queried in Redshift Spectrum. And so we've seen a lot of success with that. It makes us extremely flexible when uh, we need to make those changes, and the performance is absolutely fantastic. 
The other thing that we've been doing with it is our cycling logs. So as mentioned, Pursuit is sending hundreds of millions of data points every day. And so we need to have some kind of operations around those bikes and make sure that when someone gets on a bike that it's going to operate the way that they want it to. Sometimes bikes need maintenance, and that's just a fact of life. So what we actually do is we've defined that data in AWS Glue as well, and we have Athena that runs a query over it and actually sends those uh, results in a CSV to Slack. And so people from our cycling operations team can actually see which bikes are starting to maybe have gaps in the data that's sent or the wattage is above what's normal, uh, and they just get a daily file in Slack that they can go and check that data. Other data sources that we have are from our club management software data, and then any other data service that enhances our, uh, our services as well. And so making it all work, here's some tools and tips. So AWS Glue is absolutely mandatory. You will need it for the data that's in S3. You'll just need a way to define that data. And then from there, you have your options. So you can use Amazon Athena, EMR, or Redshift Spectrum. What we've found is that when we need to do maybe an ad hoc query uh, that's serverless, we'll use Athena for it. And so that's where we used it for our cycling logs. EMR is great for the big transformations, so we use that for our Clickstream data sets. And then the other thing we do as well is we use Redshift Spectrum for when we need to join that data in S3 to data sources that are also in Redshift. And so our analysts are actually joining together our data from our Clickstream data sources in S3 to maybe member profile information that's sitting in our Redshift cluster. And just some tips here. Um, where, where you can, try and leverage self-described high compression parquet files. So the header of the file is actually in the file itself. So you don't have to get rid of the header like you would for a CSV. Um, and that's what makes it available for you to basically pick whichever column you want, depending on its indice. Um, where applicable, you can really lighten the compute load on Amazon Redshift by utilizing EMR or Athena. So that's why we use it for our Clickstream data. And then something that's really cool that you can do here is for data that's sitting in S3, um, in Redshift Spectrum, you can run all the same commands that you would in Redshift. So if you need to do an unload, you can actually unload from S3 to S3 and do a transformation in the process. And we actually use this for our Clickstream data because it's such raw data we want to roll up the data and make it easier for the analyst to go through and pick out insights from it. So we actually have uh, some scripts that are unload scripts that roll up the data by just simply doing an unload statement and defining a new table in AWS Glue. And then lastly, one of the things that makes it uh, very, one of the things you can do very easily are comparison queries. So if you need to compare two days of data, if you're saving daily snapshots of a database from Redshift into S3, you can just go back and query off two different folders of data, see the comparison, and you know, see what the difference is between those two days. And so here's actually a sample AWS Glue definition that we have uh, on our Clickstream data. So we defined our table, and then every time we need to bring in a new column name, there's just an area to edit your schema. You add it in there, say what your data type is, and you're good to go. Uh, and you can actually see at the very bottom here, we have DT, which is our date time, so if your data structure in S3 actually includes an equal sign, whatever is before that equal sign, which we have DT, so that's our date time. So DT equals, and we use year, 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 month, month, day, day. And so that allows us to actually pick out the specific folders that we want to query. So if we have ter terabytes upon terabytes of data for our Clickstream, uh, from our Clickstream provider in S3, if we just provide a very specific date time, then we can query just that. So if we want to query 50 megabytes instead of 10 terabytes, it's very easy to do so. So something we're pretty excited about, again, I got back to like the SDLC thing that I brought up before, is automation and DevOps on Redshift. So like, you know, a lot of analytics systems have difficulty, even cloud-based ones, like adopting kind of modern, like kind of like, testing and pipeline uh, and deployment pipeline operations, like modern DevOps uh, principles. So we've really worked to try to achieve that to increase our time to benefit. So we've built some homegrown tools from DAG execution to Hambot, which is our data quality monitoring and test suite um, for our Redshift S3 data lake. Um, some ops monitoring, we use Rundeck for scheduling and Jenkins is kind of like our orchestration flow. Um, for all of our deployment and testing pipelines. So 
how do we do deployments? Like, how do you do automated regression on a data warehouse? It seems very challenging, mainly because like if you're testing an app, you're doing unit testing, integration testing, you know, you can, fixture data is not a big thing, um, you know, or at least not giant generally. Um, when you have a data warehouse solution, the fixture data is the whole database or all of the source system. So it can be very difficult to try to do automated test. So the way that we do it is we essentially, our Jenkins flow will spin up ephemeral Amazon Redshift clusters, which could be empty, could be of some specific date with a known state, or yesterday, you know, if we want to do quick, like, uh, hotfix deployment regressions. So what, what happens is we do that, then we spin up Docker containers of our Maximilian assets. We run all of our major transformations because we're using S3 as many of our sources, or at least like an S3 forward strategy. The original data is sitting there ready. We run our handbot checks, and if all goes well, we, uh, you know, essentially allow things to merge to master. And currently we're working on schema deployments as well. And for fun, you know, in the spirit of automation, you know, again, to make our developers happy, um, for Slack users out there, we allow our developers to create EMR clusters and even Redshift clusters in EC2 themselves. So we've created a bot named Vincent who allows our operators to, you know, create clusters, kill clusters, check the status of clusters, get connection information all through Slack. So it makes them much easier, it makes it much easier for them to use in the console. They don't have to bother our admins. And, um, you know, it reduces the console access requirement by giving them, like, kind of a sandbox of what they can do. And I just want you to note his shirt. He's actually representing yeah. him. <laughs> and so every hero needs a villain. So we decided to go a little bit further with the bots. And this is actually bot-to-bot -bot communication that we have. This is Maximilian. He is the villain. So every time someone brings up a cluster and maybe they're working with it, Inevitably, someone may forget about it, it may fail, it may be sitting in that waiting stage. So he actually comes in every day at a certain time and says that he's going to destroy these clusters. Hopefully, someone comes in and saves them. If they do not, he destroys them. But the big benefit here, the takeaway is that <laughs> you don't always have to have someone going through and monitoring uh, you know, how long these clusters are running. If someone needs them, he'll come in there and do the job for you. So in terms of results, you know, things are really good. We're very happy with Redshift and our overall move. Um, you know, we have seen huge, you know, more than the cost savings, we've seen huge increases in productivity. We replatformed and productionalized our uh, entire system in uh, uh, our first two apps in four months and refinished our platform in under a year. Um, as we said, it's very dependable, um, faster time to benefit since now, since Redshift is a service with a full API, we can do really cool things in terms of automated regression to make sure that when we're doing uh, changes to our system that we don't have unintended consequences or break anything. And again, the huge cost savings over Terra, Teradata. Um, we are paying 20% approximately of the maintenance and support that we were paying with our uh, Teradata and SQL Server um, uh, legacy. So, uh, you know, that alone, not to mention the original software expenditure, software and hardware expenditure. So it worked out so well, we helped out our, our cousin Blink, and we built them a brand new Blink data warehouse as well, and that only took us four months. And it was a little cheating, because they do run a few of our systems, and they're not that dissimilar, but um, they're very happy, and everything's going very well there. And uh, just in terms of lessons learned, you know, try when possible, use an S3 data lake uh, approach whenever possible. You know, it can do great things in terms of sharing data across clusters, across systems, across technologies, as well as when you're trying to automate uh, testing and regression. Um, strive to decouple, again, going back to the architecture diagram, we try when possible to uh, give people lakeshore marts that are versioned or versioned APIs versus having them reach into our system. Um, plan for flexibility. We had problems with our clickstream data. Glue came along in Spectrum and we, we jumped on board as quickly as we could. Um, uh, one size doesn't fit all, you know, use the right tool for the job, you know, hammer when you need a hammer. And again, automate everything, leverage automated test and deployment in your analytic environment. And I'll leave this up for a second. We are always hiring and looking for smart people. So if you like cool stuff, <laughs> come see Equinox Careers. And uh, thank you. Thanks, it was a great story. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So I think we have uh, about
10 minutes or so, so if there's some questions, we're happy to take them uh, for the next few minutes. Uh, there's wanna, a couple. I guess there's, uh, maybe I can walk around and see if I can, I guess if you have a question, come run up and find me and I can have the mic for everyone. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, thank you everyone for letting my uh, question go first. Thank you for a beautiful presentation, very informative. Uh, one of the slides you mentioned that uh, we try to be, uh, you know, especially coming from the Kimball, pure Kimball approach, we try to be conservative uh, for type two you said. Uh, so does it mean that you try to minimize the use of it and used uh, type one instead? Or can you please elaborate more on that? Yeah, yeah, so, so I think we use a combination of techniques. So first, we really make sure that we need it. We don't like kind of greenfield, build it, and they will come sort of thing. Um, we do have a few entities which are kind of like log data, like slowly changing, more traditional. Um, but you know what we do use as a technique, since we can have flattened data structures, and we want to avoid joins, you know, because it's a distributed system. We do at times flatten data into our event tables themselves. So if there is kind of like point in time information, it's used a lot by analysts or in like our standard reports, we will sometimes roll it into the event table itself. Pragmatism. So uh, I've used JetShift for about a year now or a little over a year. One of the things I encountered difficulty is that we can define all kinds of constraints on your tables, but they're not enforced. Yeah. Primary keys or foreign keys. Yeah, so it's a, it's a good point. So, so, the, uh, so oh, I'm sorry. is there any plan, I guess, for Gre question for Greg, is to when will Redshift start enforcing those constraints, primary or foreign keys? Yeah, I don't know where Greg is. I can tell you our point of view once. Okay. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll give you my quick take on it. Okay. You know, like, especially after having, like, a very large, like, relational database, one of the first things we did to improve performance was turn off all the constraints. <laughs> yeah. So... And that happens a lot. Um, what we do is we actually use our handbot test again because all of our systems are flattened for the most part. So, uh, you know, when we do have like a constraint, like again, we're linking out to a person or an employer or an asset, we essentially run um, assertions on the table throughout the day or at night to assure that we have integrity. So, like, oh, we don't have like an employee reference who doesn't exist. That creates alerts, opens pager duty tickets, or reports people on Slack. So, we monitor it, you know, kind of after the fact, after the data's been created. Right, so there's a, there's a manual intervention pretty much every day. Well, otherwise the you have a manual can... intervention anyway because your ETL would reject. Yeah, right. You know, you're going to have it either way, right? right? It either makes it in or sitting in some reject queue. Right. Sure. <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank oh, thank you. you. stuff. And second of all, um, what were just some of the biggest problems you guys faced and how did you overcome it when migrating from Teradata to your Amazon solution stuff? Yeah, so it's a good question. So it took us about a year with an asterisk and that is only because we, it, it took a little bit longer but we had a hiatus for some other initiative, right? But all totaled in terms of dedicated person effort to migrate, it took us about a year. Um, in terms of the impedance that we had between Teradata and Redshift, we found that Redshift was way easier. Again, a lot less platform-specific knowledge than Teradata. Um, and data structure is much simpler in Redshift than Teradata. Teradata likes normalization and all stuff like that. So we found everything easier. The one thing that we just had to be mindful of moving SQL Server and Teradata to Redshift, which is something that they've made huge strides on, was concurrency. You know, and, and you know, just being aware of it. We've never had a concurrency issue because of our planning and the way that we use Redshift and the way that we use the Lakeshore strategy. Um, but we were just very mindful of it throughout the process. You know, Teradata and SQL Server. SQL Server being a relational database is a different animal. So we just thought about it and we never had any problems. Maybe we have time for maybe one, one more question that we're happy to take outside as well. But. 
Thanks. Great presentation, guys. Um, how did you guys decide when to use Spectrum versus going ahead and loading that directly into your cluster? Yeah, so <laughs> so that actually came upon uh, came upon me specifically because uh, the analysts were like, we want this. And <laughs> the entire process that we had of putting into Redshift, um, you know, just every time we put something new in there, the next question would be, this is a great data point. Can we have it, you know, for like the past year? And so then it would be like, oh, man, we got to go back and backdate all this data too. And so it just became this process that add something, backdate it, update ETL script. And it was, it was something that we were just kind of like, there's got to be an easier way to do this. And so we explored some options, came across Spectrum, and we're like, let's just go for it. And so um, we had also come across the Parquet file format, which has done wonders. And so we just kind of went for it, tested it out, and we're like, let's see if this actually works. And it worked beautifully. And so since then, we've just trying to, begin, trying to get more and more stuff in there. So if you have some Clickstream data sources that uh, maybe you want to test it out with, anything that's mutable, really, will, I imagine you'll find pretty good strides with it. Like schema mutable, I'd say, something that evolves over time. Because like our old pipeline, we used to take like our Clickstream data, run a Spark job, rip it down to like 60 name columns, yeah. shove it into Redshift. And like every time they're like, oh, an attribute dropped off, the job would break. Whenever they wanted an attribute they weren't looking at prior, we'd have to recast forever like a lot of data. So this is just taking that out of the equation. We don't, we don't have to worry about it at all. We just change the table definition and something magical happens. Plus it deals with sparser evolving data. So if a column drops out of the file, it doesn't care. Yeah. And it's yeah, there for historicals. Yeah, that's the other nice thing too, is you can actually plan ahead with uh, Spectrum and AWS Glue as well. So if I know that there's you know, a new data point that an app is going to be collecting, I can actually set up the data feeds to start passing in that new data point. I can tell AWS Glue that that new data point is going to come. And then um, even before it arrives, the column is just empty. So let's say I'm going on vacation or something. I've set this up and something goes live while I'm out of office. Then that data automatically starts coming in. So you can even plan ahead before this stuff makes it in. So once it starts uh, being collected, it automatically is projected into uh, Spectrum as well. All right. Well, I think um, if there's any more questions, I think we're at least I'm happy to meet in the hallway. But uh, yeah. thanks, uh, Ryan and Elliot, for your time. And thanks, everyone, for participating. And uh, again, if you're interested more in details, I'll have my own session at 5 o'clock. So I might be the only one in the room at that hour. But if you want to come by again, otherwise, thanks for everyone attending. And thanks for a great presentation.